Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this uh, online event from the Democratizing Work Movement called Reflecting on the Ontario Assembly on Workplace Democracy. My name is Hélène Landemore. I'm a professor of political science at Yale University, where I teach political theory. I'm the author of two books in deliberative democracy, respectively Democratic Reason and Open Democracy. And I, I've been working in this space uh, of deliberative democracy for many years now, uh, inviting us to rethink what we mean by democracy, and in particular, inviting us to consider a new form of democratic representation based on lot rather than election. So for me, it's been hugely rewarding to see the momentum behind citizens' assemblies in the last 10 years. Um, deliberative assemblies, for those of you in the public who may not know about them, are bodies of ordinary citizens that are selected uh, through a process of civic lotteries. And they aim to bring together people who would never meet otherwise and give them a chance to engage in respectful, informed, um, you know, uh, consensus building deliberation, exchange of reasons, argument, but also stories and, and personal narratives, uh, so as to build the kind of um, outcomes that actually solve problems, but also the kind of civic friendship that we seem to have lost in the, the realm of um, ordinary politics. So, in fact, uh, I think this momentum has been uh, Remarkable. Uh, the OECD report uh, talks about um, of 2019 talks about a deliberative wave of close to 600 processes based on on um, randomly selected bodies in the world at this point. From the famous Irish conventions of 2012 and, and 16 on on uh, marriage equality and abortion, to recent French ones that are, I'll say a word about in a minute. And not even including recent developments at the global level uh, with the Global Assembly on Climate from two years ago and even the um, community forums developed by the company Meta on uh, cyberbullying in, um, in the metaverse. So I was myself appointed to the governance committee of the last citizens convention in France, which convened 185 randomly selected citizens to deliberate about end of life issues specifically euthanasia and assisted dying, over nine sessions of two days and a half, so 27 days of intense work overall. I think it was a success, if I dare say so myself, and definitely one of the most rewarding things I have done in my professional life. Um, it will apparently be followed very soon by a third French uh, Citizens' Assembly, presumably on immigration, as um, the Minister of Democratic Renewal, Olivier Véran, indicated in a recent interview. Meanwhile, since I have had the pleasure to meet Isabel Ferreras at Harvard in, in 2002, uh, I have seen a similar momentum building behind her ideas about workplace democracies and, and culminate with the birth of the democratizing work movement in May 2020 during the pandemic. And so it's an absolute treat today to introduce this panel, which brings together two of my favorite things, uh, namely deliberative democracy and citizens' assemblies on the one hand and workplace democracy on the other. If anything, this already proves that citizens are able to discuss absolutely anything um, from you know, uh, technical issues, scientific issues to uh, uh, changing completely our, our capitalist system. So I'm now going to pass the baton to Simon Peck, an associate professor of business and society at the Gustafsson School of Business at the University of Victoria, who served as the steering committee lead of the Ontario Assembly on Workplace Democracy in 2022. I cannot wait to hear the insights um, uh, he derives about you know, uh, the, 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 the governance issues that he may have encountered in this, uh, in this position and to hear what the rest of the panel has to say about how we can um, use citizens' assemblies to grow both the deliberative wave and the democratizing work movement. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the panel. Thank you so much, Hélène, for that very generous introduction and for, for helping frame what we've been trying to do with this project. So my name is Simon, um, and I have the pleasure of chairing this session uh, on behalf of our broader team at the Ontario Assembly on Workplace Democracy. So as a brief roadmap of what is to come, 
Um, I will begin with a few minutes just introducing the assembly um, and, and how, how specifically we put, to, put into practice some of the principles that Ellen mentioned in her introductory remarks. I will then pass the baton on to my friend and colleague, Rafael Gomez, who was the chair of this assembly and it can explain in a little bit what the takeaways were from this process and how they fit within the Canadian context of labor relations and worker voice. Uh, he will then pass the baton on to Angelo Di Caro, uh, who is the director of research for UNIFOR, which is Canada's largest private sector union, and was a, a stakeholder witness in our assembly, so, so he can speak to that. And then finally, Angelo will pass the baton on to Greta, uh, who helped frame one of our discussions also as a stakeholder in the assembly, uh, and is an actor and labor organizer with a particular focus on empowering workers in the retail sector. So Angelo and Greta, their role was to share anything they uh, good and bad of how they experienced their role as these stakeholder witnesses and experts um, and share their perspectives on how they think tools like this could be used in different contexts and how they perhaps could be improved as well. And then Greta will pass the baton on to everyone and we'll do a moderated Q&A um, and go from there. So thank you all for coming. So I'll just share my screen now to uh, have a couple of background slides. So for those of you who haven't seen um, an overview yet of, of this process, so this included 32 Ontarians selected through Civic Lottery, as, as Alain mentioned, which is a, a different approach to selecting people to, to participate in civic deliberation and decision making. Um, so there were five sessions held over 26 hours focused on this question, which is how can workers in Ontario, which is a province in Canada, wherever and however they are employed, have a say in workplace decisions in order to make their workplaces better, safer, fairer, more inclusive, and sustainable. Uh, so the reason we wanted to focus on this from an academic perspective, uh, as, re as researchers interested in workplace democracy, is that research points consistently to a voice gap between expected opportunities to voice at work and actual opportunities to voice at work. Declining unionization um, is, a, is an issue as well in several countries, and there's a lack of robust alternatives for worker voice in many jurisdictions as well. Um, so we wanted to generate a report and recommendations to improve worker voice and promote workplace democracy, uh, specifically recommendations relevant to the government, but also to labor organizations and businesses. So the civic lottery, uh, we can discuss the nuances of how that process worked after, but through a two-stage lottery process, we eventually came up to a pool of 32 individuals who represented the diversity of Ontario in terms of characteristics like gender, ethnicity, age, the type of employment, which is whether they were public sector or private sector, not employed, whether they were members of a union or non-union, and then the household income level. So these members uh, represented, uh, here you can see the breakdown across those, um, those dimensions. In terms of the Ontario, uh, you know, where they were regionally, you can see this figure. And, and of course, much of Ontario's population, in fact, is in that bottom, uh, bottom right part of the province. So you can see that in the south region, there were 25 individuals in the east region, five. And in the north region, there were two, which corresponds to a much uh, smaller relative population. But again, we wanted to make sure we had representatives from across the great province to share their perspectives and, uh, and experiences. Very briefly, um, I'll put the link to the report uh, after I finish my remarks, just so that you can um, you can dive in into greater detail if you would like. But this it followed a standard design where there was an orientation at the beginning. So these members came together, got to know each other on Zoom, got to know their host and facilitation team and all of us. Uh, and then we kick things off with what, what's termed the learning stage, where there were opening remarks from various experts um, to help frame the context and then sharing, sharing their knowledge about the voice gap and various practices that are available. And then we had a virtual public policy debate that was optional for participants, but many did in fact join um, between employment and labor law lawyers to share their perspectives on specific um, techniques that are available to address the voice gap. And there was a consulting stage, uh, which included remarks and Q&A periods with academic experts and uh, stakeholders. Uh, and then there was a deliberation stage where we had opening remarks from Greta, who will be presenting today. Uh, and this stage actually involved 
a lot of focused opportunities for the 32 members to speak together, learn from each other, and work towards developing their understandings of what's what concerns them and their recommendations. And then finally, there was the recommendation stage where they polished up their recommendations that are all available in the report and that Raphael will jump into shortly. And these are the values uh, that the participants came up. So in a practice, in a process like this, it's often helpful to have some ability for members to figure out, you know, how do they, what values do they want to have to underpin the work they're going to be undertaking together? So they, they agree that they, their work will be premised on the values of employer success, accountability and responsiveness, respect, kindness and empathy, empowerment, balancing power between the employers and workers, safety and security, education, tools, and resources, equity and inclusion, and finally, clarity, transparency, and openness. And you'll see how a lot of these values really work their way through uh, the concerns and then the recommendations that Raphael will jump to right now. Raphael, the uh, baton is passed to you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I just, now that I have the, the floor here, I just wanna thank again, the organizers uh, for allowing us to speak about our project here today, Isabel, Alain, thank you so much. And I wanna thank also Angelo and Greta for appearing in our assembly and speaking to our assembly members. It made such a difference. And I I know you weren't there. In fact, none of the audience, I think here today, apart from Ann, uh, Simon, myself, and, a, and another colleague who we should mention, Andrew Gibson, who actually started this project. He's a federal government employee, works for Employment Skills Development Canada. Um, and he took a secondment or a sabbatical, if you will, and he joined us at the University of Toronto at the Center for Industrial Relations to pursue this project. And um, it made a big difference. The very last day when everyone spoke in our assembly, we had every single individual speak directly about their impression of what the assembly had achieved. It was so touching. I was almost in tears, right? <laughs> you, you hear words like democracy, demo the democratizing work initiative, which is a great way of phrasing it, uh, and I've always talked about workplace voice and workplace democracy. Um, but those are like at a level of abstraction. When you hear people evoke those same ideas, but in their words, in their language, with their lived experiences, it is a power punch uh, right to your, your gut, if you will. And it strikes you emotionally and intellectually. It's such a force. These assemblies are such a powerful tool. I cannot stress how important it was for me as an academic who's been studying this, as Angela knows, he was one of my students uh, in, a, in a time far past. Uh, I've been working on this as, even as a graduate student, as a research assistant with these same ideas, but often removed, even with a survey, you get kind of a detached view of what workers might be really thinking because you're constructing the questions, you're constructing the narrative. And here it's, there's such, such a dual play between the assembly members and yourself and, um, very, very powerful. So <laughs> with that pretext, I, I, I am going to talk about what we learned uh, in the course of doing this work. And, you know, maybe this part was was known, but I didn't hear it so tangibly with so many examples. Um, we, we were just talking about retail work, by the way, before the whole audience joined us. Um, Greta uh, works in that space and Angelo started his career in retail. But the amount of precarity, even in a low unemployment environment um, for workers to raise their voice, uh, is palpable. And that you can see is one of our first uh, areas, the repercussions and retaliations. Notwithstanding, you know, we're, these weren't radical people per se, one of their top line items, and they made us put that there, is we're not interested in sinking the employer. We're not interested in uh, usurping the means of production, if you will. We want more say, but we want employers to be successful. So they're already in line um, to have that success um, and the, as a precondition to having more say. So they're, they're predicating that they have knowledge and they would like the freedom to express that knowledge without the worry that they might lose their job because of it or they might antagonize a power structure inside of an organization. And they were so, 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 so attuned to what makes the threat of reper repercussion retaliation greater, the precarity felt by their coworkers. They noted if they were working with alongside more younger workers or recent immigrants or temporary foreign workers, we've now have a huge system of temporary foreign work in Canada, which never existed. Our model was always premised on immigration pathways. And now we've adopted what is basically a um, European 
style, uh, you know, temporary foreign worker that has no, none of those same um, protections that a that a citizen or or, or permanent resident or an immig even an immigrant has, um, because once you're a temporary foreign worker, you have no recourse but to be working with that employer. And if something happens to that employment relationship, you are sent back home. The workers in this assembly, the, the people we talked to noted that. They knew that when they were working alongside more uh, vulnerable workers, the workplace became less open, less transparent, um, less open to, to discussion and voice. Very, very perceptive. Um, and those were the kind of two top line items that I would note. I think there's a, uh, there's a mic on somewhere. Um, but, uh, the top line items are really perceptive. Um, just, there we go. Okay. Uh, the open mic has been closed. No, it's open again. I think it's closed again. Oh, okay, there we go. We can move the... I think it's Arild and my Arild. I think it's just turning on every time someone's speaking. All right. Um, the last thing I'll mention here is that the workers wanted tools, though. They could identify the problem. Maybe as academics, too, we're very good at identifying problems, but where are the solutions? And they pointed to things like having more training and resources, how to exercise voice in a practical way. What are some tools? because many of the workers, this was mentioned in our private sector, lack union representation. The decline of unionization has really occurred on a twin track, especially in the Anglo-American economies, especially in Canada. Overall unionization rates have sort of plateaued around 30% for the last 20 years, 25 years. All the while, gradual increases in the broader public sector and gradual decreases in the private sector. So if you look at a graph, it basically, it looks like two, two, two streams going in opposite directions. Public, broader public sector unionization approaching 80, even 90% in some estimates, if you look at everyone that's possibly uh, unionized in professional associations as well, and then less than 15% in the private sector. Raphael, so, would you like me to, speaking of the recommendations, would you like me to transition to those on the slide deck? Absolutely, thank you. So that's, that's in keeping with the concerns that, and if you looked at the, the bottom line there, some of those concerns, um, led to the recommendations. And again, these were framed from the assembly. From the assembly, where's my dog? <laughs> After hearing from experts, from people with lived experiences, from uh, practitioners and uh, even industry representatives, uh, employers and so on. So improving the bargaining process, having access to some form of voice, the problem, and this might not be known to quite everyone, the detail, the, the kind of um, system of unionization that exists in, in, in North America, in particular, Canada, the U.S. shares this as well. The default option is non-union. You know, if you go into an organization that's set up a, a new firm, a new workplace, a new retail outlet, it by definition is non-union, that workplace. Every workplace has to get organized. And even if you manage to organize a workplace, 49.9% of people say, yeah, we'd love to have a union that protects our interests. That workplace gets nothing, zero. There's no representation. We have an institution called Joint Health and Safety Committees, uh, which is great. Uh, and it was set up, actually pioneered in Ontario itself in the 1970s. So it carved out one area, one space where workers could um, have a say, but over the remit of health and safety. And there's a committee structure between management and employees. Having said that, the research has shown that those committees only work best where there's already a union. So there's a statutory commitment that every workplace should have joint and health and safety committees, union, non-union, but they work best where there's empowerment. So even in that situation, we see that there's a failing in the statutory realm. So they were looking to options and they heard options and they came up with ideas around broader base bargaining, things that could tie in if there's at least a density of, of some representation for workers it, that's not extended to every, say, retail worker, but there's enough retail uh, operations and workplaces that have collective agreement. Why shouldn't those some of those benefits and those terms and conditions of work be extended to the workers that don't have the union representation? The key, though, with us is democracy. It's it's one thing to get the benefits of of good deals in terms of 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 a better wage and a better job security um, trade off, 
but you still want input and involvement. And that was the really, I think, a tricky part. And under kind of a very broad thing about voice enabling statutory changes, we exposed them to ideas like works councils, which exist in Europe, and maybe a form that would exist in North America, in Canada, in Ontario, would be something that encompasses the protections that workers already have. We have pretty good statutory protections. These are the minimum protections that every worker has. The problem is always is enforcement, right? And, and eyes on the ground. So if you could enable, create a committee structure whose task at least at the very minimum would just be to enforce the statutory provisions that are already on the books for every employee, that could be sort of the germination or the seed of collective voice and collective representation in every work, workplace. So that was a very, very uh, interesting idea that again came from the assembly when we exposed them to sort of all of these perspectives. Um, and just going back to what I said, hearing from each of the assembly members was really a transformative experience for me as an academic. I've been doing work with data sets and thousands of observations. To hear from 32 people directly probably made the biggest impact of my entire career. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to Angelo who also participated. Awesome, Angelo, uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I, um, uh, I, Simon and uh, Raphael are, are so dynamic as they speak. And uh, when you give me a time limit, um, I, I have to write my notes down or else I'll, I'll, I will talk forever. And, uh, and so this is what I, I will attempt to do here. But uh, I just want to say good morning or, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are uh, right now in the world. Um, uh, as was uh, mentioned, my name is Angelo DeCaro. I'm the National Director of Research for Unifor, which is a union in Canada uh, made up of about 315,000 uh, members. We are Canada's largest trade union in the private sector although we do represent uh, workers in, uh, in a range of public sector uh, uh, workplaces as well. Uh, I've been a member of Unifor uh, and its predecessor union, uh, the Canadian Auto Workers Union, for uh, going on 28 years now. Uh, I worked as a part-time supermarket clerk and uh, still am a proud member of, uh, of Unifor Local 414. Uh, I've been on staff at the national office serving in a number of different capacities uh, since I began in, in 2006. And uh, as uh, Raphael mentioned, I, I'm also a graduate of the Center for Industrial Relations at the University of Toronto, which uh, a group that played a, a huge role uh, in this report and this initiative. And whenever my school comes calling, uh, I, I answer the bell you know, for them. So uh, anytime. It was a pleasure to uh, have been invited to participate in the assembly as a, a labor stakeholder, a witness stakeholder. And as I mentioned to the group, when I first had the chance to meet with them, uh, interrogating the question of workers' voice in today's economy, I, I say is a very critical one. And I'm very impressed with the size and the scope of this network uh, that has, uh, has been built and is doing a fabulous work. Uh, worker voice is the bedrock on which the foundations of the trade union movement was built. The Ontario Assembly on Workplace Democracy, I'd say was itself an illustration of worker empowerment through voice. Citizens' assemblies done right can be a powerful and persuasive tool to legitimize and add credibility to civic debate and discussion at a time when it's uh, very clear that uh, the legitimacy of our civic institutions is, uh, is under threat. Now, it's one thing for Unifor, a large trade union, to tell workers and voters that democratic and participatory collective bargaining is the most powerful and impactful expression of workers' voice there is. That's another thing when a bipartisan and representative group of workers come together and say it themselves after they've studied it and coming to their own conclusions. As a stakeholder, I'll tell you how validating it was to hear the concerns raised by the assembly about workers lacking the courage and the knowledge to speak out at work. These are experiences that trade unions hear about all the time in our organizing work, and I'm certain we'll hear more about that next uh, from Greta. Workers uh, who are often dismissed as complainers, workers who by speaking up feel they are viewed as selfish, self-serving, entitled. The assembly also validated the role of unions themselves as vibrant democratic organizations and validated collective bargaining as a mechanism that must be better harnessed, that must evolve, and that must be tailored to the needs of workers in all industrial sectors, both new, emerging, 
uh, and old. This is evidenced by the many innovative, and I, I, I put an asterisk beside the word innovative because it's innovative in a Canadian context, not necessarily a global context, but the, the recommendations that were made by the Assembly to modernize and expand unions and collective bargaining coverage in law. Unions are platforms for democratic participation and worker voice. Union meetings are places of open debate and dialogue and learning. Union conventions are opportunities to present transformative ideas and to prioritize organizational goals. These are spaces of engagement and the meaningful exercise, or at least one example of the meaningful exercise of voice. Now, as a 15-year-old supermarket uh, clerk, I was able to practice democracy because I had the privilege of getting a job in a, uh, in a unionized uh, facility. And I, I could practice democracy at 15 years old, three years before I could legally vote in a Canadian government election. I could put my name forward and I could run for election as a union steward, which I did. I could vote for my local union president and my local union executive board. That's a very, very powerful value proposition for building a stronger, more democratic society. More than that, unions often approach their role as stretching beyond the confines of bargaining table. Unions like Unifor are very public facing and attuned to social issues and social movements. The fight to improve working conditions and empower working people, it doesn't start and stop at the punch clock. Work happens in a larger social and economic context. And so the decisions made by elect governments influence as much, if not more, the lived experiences of working people. And if workers have no voice, no capacity to meaningfully engage in those discussions, then this voice gap that's been identified through this exercise, it grows wider. Unions, therefore, serve as platforms of, of civic engagement. We help workers navigate complicated bureaucracies and seize opportunities to inform public consultations and influence decision making. This not only has an effect on outcomes, but it's a learning experience for workers themselves. It's a capacity building exercise that empowers workers, even if they are not union members or no longer union members. Things like how to organize a deputation. At, at City Hall? Uh, how do you have the confidence to speak in front of a parliamentary committee? Understanding where and how to engage with a local member of parliament or local member of government. These are essential, basic civic skills that unions and union representatives help workers to develop. And it's difficult to quantify how unions have contributed over time to a more vibrant economic and civic discourse, but I can tell you through the union, working people have not only been empowered to book meetings and organize petitions, but also run themselves for government office. And I think that's a very transformative and, and powerful, uh, powerful thing. I, I don't want to suggest that unions, uh, I, you can sense my bias uh, where I'm coming from in this conversation, but the uh, unions are not perfect or that our industrial relations systems are a model of efficiency and there's no need to change. No, that's not my point. And that's what I also appreciated through the dialogue of this assembly. I recall a really thoughtful, very challenging questions from assembly participants that followed my, my presentations. Questions, frankly, from union members themselves who are expressing their own positive and negative experiences in the workplace dealing with their own union. Uh, one of the starting point concerns that the assembly raised was that unions themselves have improvements to make uh, and improvements uh, for uh, in, in uh, enhancing workers' voice. That there are also dangers for trade unions that look too far inward and how that can in effect compromise workers' voice. The assembly uh, issued recommendations directed at unions to help make a complex union structure more accessible and responsive to members, to be more inclusive, to avoid workers within unions feeling resented or feeling dismissed. These are very important criticisms that I think carry a great weight in a forum like this. The Assembly also noted a diminishing union density in Canada, and, and Raphael spoke to this, and the declining influence of collective bargaining as a problem that needs to be resolved, not some sort of evolutionary trend in the modern economy. In the past couple of years, overall trade union membership in Canada has topped 5 million for the first time 
However, since the 1970s, union density has fallen, specifically fallen in the private sector. And as Raphael was, was mentioning today, seven, uh, one in seven private sector workers in Canada have access to collective bargaining. And that is a far cry from what was about one in three in the 1960s. For workers in sectors that I worked in and Greta worked in, the retail and hospitality sectors, for instance, which are two of the largest yet lowest paid and most precarious sectors of the economy, collective bargaining is scattershot at best. And the same is true if you're a temporary worker, a migrant worker, a gig worker. The overwhelming majority of these folks have no access to unions, no say in their working conditions. Some say that it's a reflection of the anemic state of unions themselves, that unions just aren't useful anymore and workers don't need them. Of course, I, I fundamentally disagree, and it seems this assembly also disagrees. The world of work is changing rapidly, but labor laws, at least in Canada, have not kept up. On the one hand, corporations are larger, they're more complex, they're more global. This creates uncertainty and instability for workers to a greater extent. There's a greater reliance on outsourcing, fragmenting work, shedding costs, shifting risk onto outside contractors and workers themselves. Workers are being encouraged to be entrepreneurs, to start their own businesses. Workplaces are becoming smaller, more virtual. And workers, whether they want to or not, becoming more independent. This is not the world of work within which current Canadian labor laws were conceived or created, and the Assembly acknowledged this in a very pointed way. There are major limitations to the traditional structures of collective bargaining in Canada under this uh, Wagner style model uh, that uh, evolved in the US that, that must continue to evolve and expand. And among the list of, of worker voice enhancing proposals that the assembly discussed and endorsed are innovative ideas to expand collective bargaining coverage to as many workers as possible. This includes considerations of things that happen in a very small, segment of Canadian industrial relations, which is broad-based or sector-based bargaining, as well as suggesting that there should be laws that enable the consolidation of bargaining units. There's nothing new about these proposals. Unifor has raised these in one form or another over many years with government officials, but there's something very different and very genuine about the Assembly's approach. These ideas are counterbalanced by various other thoughtful proposals, that target governments and target employers outside of trade union organizing and collective bargaining models, and that's fine. I'd like to believe that such a process serves as a representative sample of the electorate in the province of Ontario, a sort of temperature check on how citizens view critical issues of the day, generally speaking, and the presentation of ideas that have popular appeal. I think this assembly model can help fill gaps in what are regular government consultations, whereby officials seek public input on proposed policy changes. Rarely are these consultations informed by the genuine reflections of citizens themselves. Rather, they tend to reproduce and regurgitate entrenched biases of stakeholders and vested interests. Decisions are filtered through the partisanship of government, and it's all very predictable, and it doesn't always make for good policy. Maybe the biggest limitation of the Assembly's work is that as a body, it carries little political weight outside of what are viewed as special interest groups. We saw this in the not-too-distant past in Ontario as well, when a Citizens' Assembly studied and then recommended reforms to our electoral system in Ontario. Despite the assembly being bipartisan, representative, and forward-looking, those recommendations were resoundingly defeated by the Ontario electorate. How does this assembly put enough pressure on governments and policymakers and leverage enough influence among stakeholders to drive this debate forward? And that remains to be seen. Regardless, though, the work that's been done by folks like Raphael and Simon and Andrew and others is very commendable. And I'll tell you, it's inspiring, and I look forward to pursuing these ideas more moving forward. So uh, those are my remarks, and hopefully I've stayed under my 12 minutes, Simon. So uh, with that, uh, I can pass the baton over to Greta. Uh, Angelo, it just like speaks to my soul, everything you said there. So I wanted to thank <laughs> you for sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Greta Whipple. 
a very brief background on myself. I worked for Indigo Books and Music, which is the largest chain of bookstores in Canada. And in summer of 2021, I led a successful union drive at their Yorkdale location. I'll be the first to admit it was like definitely a little bit spooky to, to do that. And I'm not sure if I would have had the guts to have done it if I wasn't so angry. Um, I'd been working at Indigo for five years at that point and had seen the company's regard for its frontline employees deteriorate with the culminating in a frankly horrid treatment of us during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, at that point, I decided that enough was enough, but I didn't wanna just quit. I wanted to make the workplace better. Um, and even though it's daunting to go up against the status quo and stand up and claim a voice for yourself when you're expected to be silent, I think you really just need someone to take that first step and say, no, this isn't right. And then all of a sudden you have all these people realizing that they're not alone and they can affect change. Uh, we were ultimately successful, although Ontario laws didn't make it easy to certify a union vote. And while I do think our workplace was made better for having the resources of a union in place, it wasn't a perfect solution, nor do I think it should be the only way for workers to advocate for themselves. Um, I spoke about my experiences with unionizing at the Ontario Assembly on Workplace Democracy last year. And even though it wasn't, it was just for a portion of one session, I was immediately struck by how it seemed to be composed of for lack of a more elegant phrase, regular people and not think tankers or professional listeners. And when I read the report summarizing the assembly and its findings, I had this confirmed. The demographic makeup of the participants really did seem to reflect the breadth and depth of Ontario's population. And that's why I was so heartened by the report's findings that such a wide variety of people from all walks of life were able to accurately identify the issues that I feel workers face when it comes to claiming a voice because I and my colleagues had experienced it fear of retaliation and repercussions for speaking up, employers lacking accountability and follow through, an absence of collaborative decision-making opportunities and a lack of training and resources about how to exercise worker voices. Also critically, occupational health and safety concerns and the systemic barriers facing specific groups of workers were all addressed. I felt that there was a very accurate identification of the overarching issues that workers face, which was encouraging. Um, I was particularly pleased to see that the rights of gig workers, temporary foreign workers, undocumented working persons, international students, people with disabilities, and people experiencing language barriers were being championed because existing legislation so often fails to do so. I also appreciate that the recommendations for empowering those voices were designed to incorporate the diversity of workplaces and work situations because there really is no one-size-fits-all solution to achieving more of an even playing field between workers and employers. Since most of my particular experience comes from operating within a unionized environment, I was pleased to see advocacy for increasing language accessibility and leadership op opportunities for those with disabilities and ethnic minorities. I can't blame people for being hesitant about exploring the decision to unionize if they don't understand what they're getting into, or if they don't see themselves represented in a union's makeup. So that recommendation in particular, it really seemed like a no brainer to me. Uh, protecting concerted activity through legislation and the ability to form employee councils were also standouts to me. Employee councils in particular were of interest because while unionizing felt like the best possible route for us to achieve our goals, it's certainly not perfect. It's a difficult feat to accomplish and it doesn't work for everyone. And I think the existence of employee councils and workplaces might suffice for workers' needs in many instances. Uh, there were no recommendations that I took issue with. Again, there's no one size fits all solution. And I think the assembly recommended a wide variety of ways to help empower workers. Um, and I appreciate that the recommendations were made to exist in concert with options like unionizing. Something that was absent that I personally would have liked to have seen was the lowering of barriers for unionizing in Ontario, as I think there are ways to certify union votes in Quebec, New Brunswick and British Columbia, which are other Canadian provinces that aren't quite as onerous as the pathway that exists here. Overall though, the weaknesses of the assembly aren't really any faults of its own. It's more the context that we're operating in. I'm not sure if this assembly is similar to the one in British Columbia from 2004 on electoral reform, which I think had a pathway to a referendum, or if it's more of a situation that we have to hope that legislatures will take recommendations to heart, but there's no real guarantee of action or even deliberation. Um, there's also the chance the recommendations would be implemented in some very watered down way that doesn't meaningfully reflect the intention behind the assembly, but that's out of our control, I suppose, and some change is definitely better than none. It's just frustrating to be beholden to others doing the right thing. It was like that at Indigo in the lead up to us unionizing, we were hoping that the company would do the right things for its workers, and time and again we had our opinions and concerns be disregarded.
Here, if there's an absence of a binding pathway to have the recommendations seriously considered or voted on, we're left to hope that policy makers do the right thing, which, given the current government that's in power in Ontario, I think is a tall order. I'm grateful for the Assembly's existence and for its commitment to an equitable makeup of participants using the Democratic lottery. I sort of wish the selection process for the Assembly was the way that our electoral system operated, but that is an entirely separate issue, I think. Uh, in terms of opportunities, I think assemblies such as these have broader applications worldwide. I think we often forget that we're supposed to be participants in democracy and not just existing within it. I also think that, especially in 2023, those in power have forgotten that they're supposed to serve society's best interests and not just themselves and the extremely wealthy. Assemblies like this have massive potential because they're actionable avenues beyond just voting in elections for regular citizens to make their voices heard. But I don't want these assemblies to just be screams into the void. For all of the work that has gone into this and other assemblies and have them just languish unread or be cast aside. If assemblies are not going to have guaranteed pathways to something like a referendum, then I think their existence and findings need to be circulated more widely to put pressure on elected officials to do the right thing and seriously consider them. I personally wouldn't have known about the existence of assemblies in general, much less this particular one, if I hadn't had the fortune to take part in it in some capacity. Uh, it's just tough to think that this assembly did everything right. It had a democratic selection of voices that meaningfully reflect the makeup of our society. It involved a lot of active listening from stakeholders and experts, and it came up with meaningful, reasonable, and seemingly easy to implement solutions. To have done all that, only to possibly have the work be tossed aside by those in power, is a hard pill to swallow. It's hard to think that workers, people, are struggling right now because agreed upon solutions are simply ignored because they do not align with the interests of power holders. I think the recommendations are a pathway to a healthier and happier society, but in my experience, those with power aren't particularly fond of relinquishing it. And so I definitely expect pushback from employers if this were to get to a possible policy adoption stage. In all honesty, I also think that unions might balk at some of these recommendations because right now they're one of, if not the only, readily available option for workers to claim their voices here in Ontario. If there's a little more choice, I can definitely see unions perceiving this as a threat to their power and pushing back. But I would hope, given that they were initially formed to protect workers and improve their employment conditions, that they would be happy for it to be easier for workers to make things easier for themselves. Despite having led a union drive, I wish unions didn't have to exist. I wish that employers would treat workers as people and not as a detriment to their bottom line or robots that don't have needs or as an annoyance to be undermined, minimized, overworked and disenfranchised. Also that people who are already fabulously wealthy and don't know the meaning of enough is enough can have a little bit more. But left to their own devices, most employers are not willingly going to empower their workers. The current Ontario government doesn't seem to be interested in championing worker interests on their own. I wish that this assembly didn't have to exist that people trusted to govern would do the right thing for the people they're supposed to be serving. I wish that options like what's been recommended here were already available to workers in Ontario, but they're not. And so here's the assembly. Here are the recommendations. Uh, by and large, I think everyone did an excellent job and I sincerely hope that the recommendations are adopted. I just wish there was something binding and that it wasn't just down to hoping uh, elected officials do the right thing. But if power brokers did the right thing, we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation. I'm heartened that the assembly championed ordinary people, that democratizing work found my perspective interesting enough to warrant having me here today, and that discussions like these are happening. Because even if nothing comes of this assembly's recommendations, I don't think this conversation is going away. I don't think anyone here is about to lose interest in democratizing work, and I look forward to seeing what we're able to accomplish both here and beyond. Thanks very much. Wow, those were three outstanding, excellent uh, remarks. Thank, thank you, Rafael, Greta, and Angelo. And I pre particularly appreciate Greta and Angelo how you took your challenge seriously and weren't afraid to highlight some things that you thought you know were limitations or could have been done better. Because that's the whole purpose of convening this, so that more people can do do this better all around the world. Uh, so with that, um, now we have open time for Q and A, and I know there's been some excellent exchanges that I've been trying to follow in the chat. But we can now take that from the chat into this meeting room as well. So if anyone has any questions, my job is to moderate this. So I think the best way to go is if you just raise your Zoom hand, and then I'll make sure everyone has a chance to go in order. And especially those who haven't had a chance to speak yet, I'll, I'll bring you in before giving someone else a subsequent follow up question. And you can also feel free to direct your question to anyone in particular or to the entire audience, but it's sometimes easier if, 
if you know of someone who you would like to answer, then it's it's faster if they just answer. Um, then they'll having the whole panel go through everything. Jonathan, I see your real hand. Do you want to kick things off? Hi, thank you for this amazing um, discussion. It's um, so inspiring. My question, actually, um, I was curious to hear more. Um, Raphael mentioned this, but others, you could also talk from your own experience. Um, I'm curious to hear more about what participants in the Citizens Assemblies described as how this was personally transformative. Um, so it'd be great to hear, I don't know if there's information out there in the report. I'll look at that or other places I could find this where they personally describe their own experiences. I saw the Citizens Assembly on, on climate in France, came out with a book where the citizens wrote, they wrote their own experience and they kind of described the same kind of powerful transformative experience. So if there's anything on the Ontario one that I could find online, but if you could talk more about um, what the actual participants were saying. I can chime in really quickly on that, just to say that we're, we're actually doing a research project uh, with participants that were interested in follow-up interviews to capture exactly that as part of one of the research questions. And um, uh, we're looking at specific transformations like changes in attitudes and behaviors related to worker voice. So, uh, which is, I think, a, a, a perspective that hasn't been focused on in other research on citizens assemblies. Uh, but safe to say at this point with our initial uh, scan of the data that it was quite transformative for a lot of individuals, definitely in terms of thinking a lot more about worker voice, feeling a broader sense of solidarity, and in some cases already taking some more actions towards voicing more or participating in their workplace in different ways. Uh, but stay tuned, it might be a little while until we have things published, but we can for sure let you know. Uh, Raphael, I don't know if you want to continue on and share anything. Just very briefly, I, there have been some great comments and, and I'm sure some questions come. What I perceived was a feeling that at the beginning, a little skepticism, a little reticence, but of course, the design of this poll, the Citizens Assembly through the lottery, through the um, 12,000 uh, envelopes that were literally sent out to the randomly uh, sort of selected group of citizens all worked in such a way that you think, well, 32 people, you could have just ran a focus group, taken an existing panel, you would have got the same result. You really don't. It's this very methodical way to truly get the representative representativeness of this group kind of right, which Greta mentioned too, she was struck by that. Once you get that group, you're really getting authentic voices. And you're because the group is not so big, you hear from all of them. And even the more shy ones that wouldn't speak in that larger group, we, the method of breaking it down into groups of five or six, where those groups of five or six then deliberate on their own and then come back, you get everyone's perspective. And then by the end, when everyone did speak and I was hearing it, um, I can't, I, I recall just these statements from people who then could see the connections in their lives or to lives of, that they know in the workplace, situations, examples that then were kind of like the emblematic cases of things that we were hearing at an, again, more abstract level from our, from our speakers, from our academics. They could tie the real world of work to the theories that they were being given. Yeah, that's what was very striking to me. Uh, Anna, you were next in the queue. Nice, nice to see you. Hi, no, I just wanted to add to that answer. So I'm Anna and I was, I'm a PhD student at the center. And I worked in this project as one of the uh, moderators during the discussion. So one of the things that I noticed uh, people started coming up with during the discussion groups was that they noticed how different they were in terms of background and experience and uh, origin uh, and age. Uh, but little by little, after the, the several group meetings we had, they would come up with uh, the notion that they were actually not that different after all. They had very similar concerns. They had, uh, you know, similar uh, wishes and, and hopes and fears. And, and so it was, I, I believe that it was transformative for them. If, if they were asked, I, I would say that they shared, they felt like, after all, we are not that different, and uh, and they wanted to work together, so they felt more hopeful after working for a while. I would love to know more about how it was in France. I think there are uh, different cultural aspects between what we what people do. I am from Brazil. I I have different experiences too, 
And I think there are different cultural things uh, when we see different countries. So it would be super nice to compare those sorts of uh, experiences and assemblies from different places and see if if that repeats, if, if we see people finding that they are actually more similar, have same goals and concerns and ultimately want the same. Thank you, Anna. Um, Lisa, nice, nice to see you. Uh, you're next in the queue. Hi, thank you so much. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, great. <laughs> well, this, this was a really fascinating uh, report you gave us about this event. I'm just sort of thinking aloud about possible opportunities to offer, because I, I, I can totally connect to this transformative impact this kind of experience has on people. I haven't done a citizen assembly, but I've done interviews with people directly, and so this had a similar effect on me. I mean, did, did you have any sense, or did you just sort of develop ideas maybe about how this could be leveraged politically? Like, do we need to make politicians listen to these kinds of events, or are there ways of getting the spirit of these kinds of assemblies across to people? I mean, I saw that you had some reports and so on, but I was just wondering, how could one maybe find ways of making this more widely accessible? Because that seems something that could really then maybe also help build political coalitions and get um, support for for the going steps on the political level. Did, did you have any thoughts about this? But thank you in any case, it was really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a first crack. And then I think if everyone else might have some very valuable perspectives, especially our stakeholder reps to see like what what they think would be helpful. Um, I think it's important to note, I guess, or to caveat that this was, uh, in, a, in a sense, a pilot project where we had six months to pull this entire thing off, uh, as Raphael mentioned, with our colleague Andrew's leadership. So um, in retrospect, I think there's certain things we could have done from research on deliberative democracy to really pull this off and, and have more impact. So I think things that immediately come to mind for me are involving more policymakers and stakeholders earlier on in the process so that A, they're aware of it and B, they feel some kind of um, involvement in the process and skin in the game to, to follow up on the report afterwards. So, so that's really important. Um, in an ideal world, we also could have had some kind of commitments from policymakers to at least act, consider acting on the recommendations in something like a comply or explain model. Uh, Greta, I think to your point, that would have been some kind of formal linkage. Uh, and then in terms of media as well, we, we tried our best to get this out into, into the news and through some op-eds and stuff like that. And at least personally, you know, I was a little bit surprised at how limited the interest in the media was on this. Like, I thought this was a fascinating, path-breaking initiative and then learned the hard way, perhaps, that, you know, it, what's the hook for everyday journalists? And, and unless there's that impact, there perhaps isn't that strong hook. So it was a rude awakening in some part that took a toll on my self-esteem some days when we got multiple rejections on an op-ed. But uh, I think, you know, recovering from that, realizing it's just important to have that connection to real impact because that's what people find newsworthy. The idea of just convening individuals without that clear connection is perhaps less newsworthy. And then it's a negative feedback loop in that sense. That's my personal take. Uh, why don't I pass it on to Raphael first, then Angelo, then Greta, in case you wanted to share anything about how you think this could be scaled up for more impact. Yeah, no, Greta made men mention of it too. That was one of her uh, suggestions, criticisms of our, of our panel, that it would have been empowered even more by knowing we had this channel of influence. But having said that, governments commission these things and then leave them on the dustbin too. There has to be a, you're right, Lisa's point is really well taken. What strategies do you really need to effectuate change? You almost have to look at what leverages of power, what movements in the past have achieved change. And it takes time. It's a drip, 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 constant before it reaches some tipping point. If you just talk workplace democracy, falls on deaf ear. The, the right, the press, I would say the mainstream press, the pop, whatever you want to call that, is not ready to put that into a hold. They love talking about an individual strike. I'm getting calls right now about our public sector workers, the federal workers are going on strike. Our poor colleague, yes, Andrew, <laughs> will, will also probably be on the picket lines uh, at some point soon, We're working on this project. So they love those events. They don't like the structural questions, the broader picture. Um, and you, but you, you can, over time, educate and maybe cultivate relationships, which we did actually, to Simon's credit and our communications person's credit. We have certain journalists that get it, 
but they also have to fight through editorial boards. Uh, I think we need a twin strategy. Obviously, the independent press has ballooned and blossomed during the pandemic. Actually, people have turned to lots of alternative sources, not and not like disinformation sources, but credible journalists that have just gone on their own, created independent voices. I think you have to work on those multiple levels. And of course, a formal, I think sometimes involvement of, of, of the political uh, participants as well, both the governments in power and also opposition parties. So you, cause you want to see it as a, this is a broad based issue. It, it shouldn't be labeled in a very restrictive, you know, us versus them ideological frame. It, it really isn't. It's about values. It's about the future of work, which I think everyone, once they hear it, would buy into it. Um, but it's a, I think that's our next uh, step. And, and maybe at the end, we'll tell you more about the next phase of our project, which I think we can begin to think in those strategic ways, uh, Lisa. And, and to Greta's credit, she also highlighted a couple of ideas and, and ways of, of doing that. Angelo, too, you, you have a big role to play being part of the largest union in Canada. So. And Angela, maybe I can just, uh, I think you were going to mention this a little bit as a side question, like, you know, if you could share what you think we could have done differently to get unions, for example, on board as well, to take these recommendations in, that would be also great to hear. Yes, I, I've got, I got far too much to say about, about all of this. So I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it uh, brief. Um, yeah, I, I, yes, I, I agree. I think the more, uh, these, uh, uh, exercises these these initiatives can in, involve uh, trade unions uh, can force trade unions to self reflect on on their own internal structures and and approaches I think that's always positive um, you know I'd like to think too at least in the last number of, of years Unifor has undertaken some some novel uh, ways of, of re-engaging members it's far too much to talk about in this forum but uh, there's got to be a way to complement that um, uh, and making sure that it's not just billed as a as a you're doing everything wrong and we're going to tell you what to do right and, uh, and that's how you're going to get on board so it, it's like a kind of a dualistic, uh, more more synchronized way of, of unions seeing this as value going forward. But to the to the initial question, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. What what's really interesting about this initiative and what citizens assemblies, as far as I understand them, and I I cannot profess to understand them as well as the people on this call. But um, uh, this is an exercise of driving discourse, driving debate. You're, you're you're taking an issue. No no one right now in Canada is talking about worker voice or broad-based bargaining or, or anything of that nature. We had a moment in Ontario where we had a big labor reform because the issue was politicized. We had a, the, the, the governing uh, political party at the time uh, just initiated a process. Raphael knows because he was, he was part of it doing some studies. Um, that, that was it. And then it kind of ended and then people were sick and tired of talking about this. So we're, we're talking about other things now. But the, the, the value here is we're trying to re-situate this onto the political agenda. That is very important and I get it. And uh, I, I think there's ways we can strategize around how to do that. But there's a second piece to this, which is what I, I was reflecting in, in my opening remarks. And that's the, 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 the development of public policy. And that exercise, if you think if, if everything is successful and we manage to get worker voice ideas onto the political radar, that then is going to filter its way through a policy making process. And that policy making process has faults built into it. It's a process that is very uh, isolated. It's a it's a process that has a veneer of of public engagement, but realistically, the public cannot engage in these consultations because some of them, you know, have to dissect very complex discussion papers are invited to then write written reports that have to go into government officials with their views. And then what happens is governments tend to uh, look, at, look at the feedback that they receive, and then they organize stakeholder roundtables. And, and those roundtables will include trade unions. I'm at many of these and the same people at every table. It's the same people I see all the time, which is fine. But that that's how that works you know the labor voice you've got employers business voice small businesses it more recently we've seen a push in canada for indigenous voices having dedicated stakeholders um but but for reasons of time for reasons of logistics it kind of stops and starts there 
there is no vetting policy ideas against a representative sample of citizens. Um, it's The idea is citizens told us by electing the government what their priorities are. And then those representatives in the House of Commons, they're the citizens. So when this policy turns into legislation that goes to vote, we're trusting those folks to to speak on behalf of of the country, and yes, that that that's the tenets of democracy. But it does feel like there's a big piece of this missing in that process. Yes, it will extend the time in which policies are developed, but I think there's something at least that's worthy of piloting or 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 testing out in this regard, because I think this can add a richness to this policy development that that uh, is just not there and uh, more rigor. So uh, those are, that's what I'll say about that. So sorry about the rabbit hole. No, that's, that's awesome. Um, can, I, can I say Greta, one thing? Can I just yeah, of course. An analogy or a metaphor? I know Greta might want to say a word and see Cherise's hand that's up. So it's like, we don't put a plane up in the sky, at least we shouldn't. So I guess we have examples where we have, and we've seen the damage that that does. We don't put a plane up without testing, without wind tunneling. And yet we enact these huge policy reforms or when we do, we see the consequences of that, right? Things go literally off the rails. And so we don't take, and then I think in a context of a social policy that could be so dramatic, especially when governments come in when they think they have a mandate to sweep everything away and start something new, that's very, very costly to society. So Angela's point, yes, it could slow down things, but it could make them more fit for purpose and more appropriate to the times we live in when you keep having this effective democratic sounding board from or from quote unquote regular citizens i think it's a it's a model that hasn't been um explored exploited in the way angelo couched it was really really good really excellent sorry greta you were going to say something greta and then sharice will take your question after i i think i could also talk for like five years about this so i'd love to be more concise I, the only thing i could think of to like practically implement it would be like emailing this to members of provincial parliament and trying to get them to read it. Probably easier said than done, like possibly a petition, um, like beseeching that somebody read this and consider it being um, like made into some sort of policy. And here, I know we just had our election, was it last year? Time blends together, but like bringing this to the attention of the NDP if possible, because purportedly they're supposed to have worker interests at heart. Um, so you'd think they'd hopefully be interested, but beyond that, uh, hard to say, probably one that needs a little bit more like percolating. Therese, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I, like Angelo, I'm a graduate of the, the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources and had uh, Raphael for several courses as my professor. So it's been really great to, to hear you speak again. It's been a while. Um, so I just uh, two two things I was um, curious about. One was the comment that Raphael made um, about Ontario having decent statutory provisions around workers' rights, but enforcement being the issue. And I was curious to know where you think, um, like, what factors are contributing to the lack of enforcement that's happening, and how much of that potentially could be on just the lack of knowledge and awareness among workers around like unionizing around their rights, et cetera. Um, and then maybe this kind of could also be directed at Greta because you did some organizing for, you said for Indigo, like what was your, like where, where did you start? Like what was your starting point? Like what was your knowledge base going into it? Who did you you consult that type of thing? Just kind of curious to know that. And then the second one was on the the follow up interviews that you're planning to do with the participants for the assembly. Um, so I study uh, the impact of employee voice on well being, and this assembly in and of itself is a form of voice, I think. And there's an intrinsic benefit to to voice and so it would be I guess I'm curious to know whether or not you've thought about asking questions around how the assembly impacted their well-being um and whether or not they have you know exercise if they if this has changed the way that they approach voice in the workplace 
Greta, do you want to take the first question and I'll use that opportunity to think of a good answer for the second one? Absolutely. I don't envy you that task. That's like a multifaceted venture. But for us, we really had um, the benefit of a couple of other stores uh, who had already unionized. There were two in Ontario, one at Square One and one in Woodbridge, I'm pretty sure. So they were the most relevant to us because the labor laws and the process was the same. But there was also, I believe, at least one store in Quebec and one in British Columbia who had already done this. So it was like an incredible benefit for these other stores who have already done the hard work. Like they knew hey, these are um, the amount of membership cards that you need to be signed before it can go to the board, be petitioned for like a certification vote. I don't honestly know how feasible it would have been if we had to be the first store to do it because it would have been all of that um, researching and like, how do you do it? There's no precedent. Like, what are we even standing to gain from this? So we were able to benefit from uh, two collective bargaining agreements already being in place at stores in Ontario. We were able to go to other workers at, our Yorkdale location and say, look, this is what the other stores have secured for themselves. It is possible. We've got people who've already done it who can kind of advise on the best practices for us to achieve this. Um, so we definitely benefited by having like a very real precedent. I I don't know what would have happened if, if we had tried to be the first. Hopefully we still would have succeeded, but that would have been maybe a harder sell too, like trying to find a union to represent us as opposed to just kind of going in line with the other stores. Like they went with the UFCW and we did too. Um, just to benefit from the groundwork that had already been laid, but it definitely would have been a tall order. Um, otherwise, because there's just like employers, I don't think have an incentive to put union literature in like the break room and be like, hey, you can do this if you want. Like it all would have been kind of covert work that we would have had to undertake on our own. So we were lucky for sure. And then on your second question, I was trying to rack my mind thinking about the specific questions we asked. And I think on the notion of you know them experiencing this as a form of voice, I thought that was um, that was fascinating and in a really nice way of thinking about it that I hadn't considered. We have one one potential research paper out of that data is focused on the perceptions these participants had of uh, the appropriateness of a of an approach like this to addressing the voice gap. So what we had asked them there is to try to take to answer from their perspective you know in what ways if any was it effective to have these different aspects of the process like small group discussions the random selection of participants working together as a way to develop new insights to tackle the voice gap so that might be getting a part of it and then the personal transformation we didn't ask questions specific on things like well-being but it was more of uh, attitudes and behaviors related to voice was kind of what we focused our questions in on um but i think you know, especially since this is one of the first types of initiatives like this focused on the workplace, there could be fascinating questions on much broader range impacts that could be taken at, you know, T1, T2 as well to study longer term transformation. So great point and would love to keep that conversation going. Um, so we still have a, a little bit of time. Um, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to raise your Zoom hand or pop them in the chat and we'll we'll go from there. Rafael? Because I might be, I have to leave shortly uh, by like 11.15 is another five minutes. I, I could just say one general thing that um, reminded me actually from Cherise's common question. Some of the things I've seen posted here in the chat, Isabel's <laughs> point just most recently about uh, the importance of the worker, the individuals in the workplace having this determinative say. And what Angelo said earlier too, I'm trying to tie in a lot of it about how some people recognize maybe they've had exposure to unions in the past, not perfect institutions, no human institution is, but that has to also be part of democracy. In other words, the, the unions themselves have to become more democratic in order to showcase why democracy works would work. Because if it's just another institution that gets dominated by a kind of technocracy, bureaucracy, distancing itself from the individuals that are affected by these decisions, it could actually perpetuate more decline and fewer of these institutions uh, that have a representation at work because Curious's point, why aren't statutory rules enforced? Lack of knowledge is one, lack of constant reminding of, because there's turnover in workplaces and younger workers come to work, recent immigrants come. Those things have to be perpetuated and you do need institutions uh, to help with that and some knowledge base inculcated in institutions. Um, <clears throat> I just have this idea though, Angela, I don't know if you want to comment or Greta or anyone here on the panel. The promise, too, of, of the Wagner Act <clears throat> was to, to offset the fears that employers had at the time 
is that they were talking about, well, you know, independent unions would be based at the workplace. In other words, there would only be one union for one workplace because it would be attuned to the needs of that workplace and those individuals. What feared, what was the fear among some many employers was the dominance of say more at the time though in the 1930s when these rules were put in the US in the 1940s, radical unions that were national or international in scope and who had uh, you know the agenda to make, essentially usurp capitalism or something. So what, what was fearful amongst employers was a big, powerful union kind of dealing with a very small, single establishment employer. And what the, the flip side was, well, no, the whole point of a Wagner model where you empower workers to vote at their workplace is to give the workplace voice that very <laughs> attuned uh, institution that's uh, localized, if you will. And in that sense, not bad. And then you could think of a federation of independent unions that have some common interests, maybe because they're organizing in a certain sector. I, I think that's a way of, you know, kind of getting around a lot of the, both the opposition that comes from sometimes proposals that want, that when you hear democratizing work, they immediately go to the, the end point, which would be, you know, kind of a, a large scale union that is um, more bureaucratic in nature and less democratic. So I don't know if any people feel about that. They're kind of like employee committees, if you will just that beyond the statutory minimums, they have full bargaining rights, you know, and they can sit down and negotiate with their employer. If you want me to, uh, to respond to that, uh, Raphael, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, my, my, uh, I'm not sure. I have to collect my thoughts on 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 this uh, question of, uh, of of the the uh, the deep well, failings of of, a, of the Wagner Act model uh, versus alternative models in in this case. Yeah. Well, but, this would be this would be like keeping the Wagner Act model, but like empowering. In other words, yeah, I know. You know part of the problem Unifor has, you know, any union has, are these small and medium sized private sector workplaces, and even a, a large firm like Indigo has a small, medium-sized workplace structure. And those are the structures that are so hard to organize in the current mode. However, because, you know, Unifor can be painted as this big, large, omnipresent bureaucracy that doesn't care about you, the worker, like from the employer side, when they try to port a unionization drive, whether it was more indigenous, more bottom-up, kind of like, well, the Amazon example, right, during the pandemic. All of these very sophisticated organizing attempts failed until someone who had been fired for raising questions about safety at his at his workplace started organizing, and and it was uh, an independent, if you will, DIY, right, do-it-yourself union organizing that ultimately got the first Amazon warehouse in North America organized. Yes, I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll, we can do do one further, go further south of the border. Uh, into Mexico and and watch how uh, how new um, new provisions under a, a massive labor reform are uh, are are creating these uh, these sorts of alternative modes of independent union organizing to break down what has become generations of intense structured hyper bureaucratic trade unions um, uh, that have have stymied uh, growth in uh, in wages and and working conditions. So yes, yes, anything growing stale uh, uh, becomes a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, the, I think uh, I, I, these are discussions that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you are, are, are being had right now uh, through the union. There was a commitment made at the convention that we had. Uh, I'm talking about our union and Unifor. Uh, commitment made at the 2022 convention uh, to, to begin an exploration of some of these alternative models. Uh, not, not saying we're going to scrub the, the, uh, the, the chalkboard clean of, of Wagner Act, uh, structures. This is, uh, you know, this is a, a challenge. Uh, but there, there are examples in Canada of how we've overcome some of these very uh, deep rigidities in that system, uh, to think creatively. Uh, some of the proposals that the assembly uh, frankly, have 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 put forward, including the the uh, uh, reconnection of uh, what has been a system of fragmented bargaining units, um, uh, is is seems very simple and uh, and and almost obvious, but uh, has become a real uh, deterrent to further organizing. And and again, I, I don't want to 
pass the mic over back to Greta. But uh, the, the case of Indigo, uh, I mean, would be a situation where you've got a series of relatively small, you know, I mean, they're pretty large, the bookstores, but in, in, in relative terms, they're not auto plants, right? Like they're 100 people, 150 people, something similar to a supermarket. And there's many of them across the province in all different cities. Um, and so when you when you when you certify them, when you have a bargaining agent, you're you're going to do this shop by shop, which which in in the in the in the structure of it, it creates fragmentation. It enables for a whipsawing effect of uh, for employers, and uh, and and this is replicated across hyper precarious industries like like in retail and uh not to you know not to get into all of our bargaining conversations but there hasn't been a round of bargaining that i've been to in a supermarket where we haven't raised with the company where an existing multi-site collective agreement doesn't exist and and there are multiple units about bringing them together and as quickly as we can finish that sentence the answer is no not interested um, so, so things like that. And then as workers see the utility of unions who have greater leverage, uh, being part of a great, uh, a larger unit, a master unit, um, that, that too might break down barriers to say, well, it's not just me bargaining a contract of 20 people on an island in a big province like Ontario. I'm part of a larger group that we have collective power. That brings its own challenges. But I think these are is one practical way of, of moving this forward without tearing the entire system down. But anyways, I, I, I'm going to go on many different tracks, so uh, uh, I'll pass it back maybe to Simon, uh, but I'd love to hear Greta's thoughts on that as well. Well, that was a conversation that the UFCW representatives, I think, were having with the Square One location. I'm pretty sure they were the first to unionize. Their contract, I'm pretty sure, is due to be renegotiated this year. And because Woodbridge unionized so so soon after them, the hope is that the two of them could be at the bargaining table together. Um, we also had the fortune to have, I think it was Kennedy Commons. So a store in Scarborough successfully unionized the week after we did, and we were at the bargaining table together. Weirdly, though, they insisted that we have separate contracts, even though like the verbiage was identical. So to your point there, Angelo, I think there's a lot to be said for let these units consolidate. Like they already exist. It's the same freaking company that they're working for they're just in different physical locations but they perform basically identical work so why aren't you allowing them to bargain together probably because that's a little bit uh, less of a power like less power in the employer's court right um so i'm not shocked at all and then just briefly i think even for us like right now the woodbridge store is going through a lot in that they don't feel well there's been a concerted effort by the company to undermine the existence of the union there just like the whole two years of their contract has been them trying to sabotage at every turn but there's concern i think it is valid for the workers that they, they feel like the ufcw has kind of dropped the ball like that they are happy to collect the dues um, and they don't necessarily see that work has been put in for them so thinking about the possibility for like smaller independent unions to exist like the one that was formed at amazon i think it might possibly speak better to worker interests like the sentiment right now is that ufcw despite representing such a large portion of retail workers doesn't really know how to serve retail workers which is like bizarre you know this is the main portion of your representation or your members and you don't know how to serve their interests so i think in an ideal world we would have been happy to just have teeth and be able to engage with the employer directly and have them kind of be held to task just with us. We felt that those avenues weren't present, which is why we went with the union, because there's a little bit of legal recourse behind them. But if if we had had the option to form our own union, because we know our workplace best, we probably would have, as opposed to going with the pre-existing one. It's just that they have a little bit more clout and more resources than we do as like 35 young people. Um, so, Sharice, maybe uh, I'll give you perhaps one final question, and then we might have time for another question if someone has one, but we definitely want to make sure we can wrap up on time. Floor is yours. Thanks so much. I'll try and make it um, brief. So I just wanted to circle back to the, the policy development process that Angela, you referred to. Um, so how do you kind of reconcile this tension that exists where you're trying to get the government to put employee voice, or you're trying to get employee voice on the radar of the government and into policy. But then to do that in a way, you sort of need a more substantial labor movement, right? Like you need more voice from workers. Um, 
So like, for instance, I'm um, involved in a policy lobbying initiative in the UK, and we're trying to get a policy um, incorporated into the, into the uh, UK labor law that um, is around workplace mental health. And so far, it's, I mean, it's been quite an interesting process and consulting with multiple different stakeholders, but we really lack the voice of the workers um, in our kind of campaigning. Like so far, it's just been like sort of elites, you know, experts in different fields saying like, this is what we think needs to happen. And like, it's not really doing much, like government isn't really budging. And so like, have you thought about this? And like, I don't like I'm not a political strategist, so I don't know how these things work, but I would imagine some level of polling or like again scaling up this assembly. Um just yeah, have you thought this through at all? And um just interested to hear your thoughts. Uh yes. Uh so uh, again, lots of things you can say about this. Um and and just go, re reflecting back on the on the opening remarks that I made, uh, one of the at least my my view is one of the the values that uh, unions you know provide for for workers in, in this in this expression of voice is is we become like a, it's it's like a, a platform it's like a staging ground for for members to to learn how to influence public policy discussions. Now, this I, it's not contradicting my point about how there is a lack of worker uh, uh, engagement through policy development. There is labor stakeholder meetings and, and unions, uh, depending on the government, right, are, are, are seen as, as go-to stakeholders and, and views are always solicited. It becomes the, 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 it's like the onus falls back on the union in terms of how they're going to use that, that opportunity. And I'd like to think our union does this well. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting other unions do it unwell, just different, where unions uh, will employ someone who is a government relations strategist. They're kind of like the, the go-to person. It's a very, it's a similar model of what most corporations do and associations that they, that they construct for lobbying purposes. And some unions emulate that some cases to good effect but in our case we we have uh, made a point that wherever there's an opportunity to uh, present the views of workers directly whether that be at a uh, you know through an invitation to a parliamentary committee who's studying a, a piece of legislation whether it's deputations that happen at different levels of government whether it's and i'm working on this right now um whether it's hearings that are had uh, about uh, potential, you know, uh, anti-dumping uh, reviews uh, for workplaces through the Canadian Inter International Trade Tribunal. Like the us putting forward, not necessarily me, not necessarily the national president, not necessarily the staff representatives, but the workers who are affected. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an empowering exercise. And what's fascinating about it is, is how much folks learn, how they, uh, how they use it to grow as a leader um, uh, at the workplace, uh, being a better represent, better chairperson, better, better local union president. Um, uh, but it's amazing how when you talk with them, that they're petrified. M many, many of them, not all of them, many of them are petrified at the prospect of this, saying, I can't, I can't speak in front of that group. I can't speak to parliament. I can't talk to a, you know, a government official, policymaker, a mayor, um, because, you know, and, and there's this, there's this deference to these people. And it's like, but they're, they're, they're creating a rule that's going to affect you, like your job your workplace. So you're the only one that knows what's going on, you know? And so that our job too is, is, is getting them the tools, inspiring the confidence so that they can do that. And I think that exercise reproduces itself every day in the union and so many different quarters. And, and as I said in my remarks, I think that that is a positive example of how unions, um, you know, we, we can help to better develop smarter uh, civic discourse because we're using the, our platform to engage workers directly rather than 
look at ourselves as sort of like Raphael said, the technocrats, like the, the bureaucratic structure. We know. We, we speak for you and we'll do this work for you on your behalf. That's our service to you. We view unions as a transformative exercise in that regard. It's not about us. It's about how do we empower our members. We're the conduit for that. So I, I think that that's a powerful way of looking at workers' voice and how unions play a role and also maybe makes a case for unions' existence. Because I've also seen in the chat, you know, folks are seeing this as well. You know, if workers get what they need and everyone's happy, then unions have served their purpose and we can go away and and then, you know, everything is good. And and, and I think there there's always going to be the, this this need for organizing in, in, in the broadest possible sense, not just organizing for certification, but organizing workers under their common class interest, right? Um, and so, so anyways, I'm not even sure if I've answered your question, but that's what I thought of when you asked. And so hopefully I've, I've delivered something uh, somewhat intelligent uh, for you. <laughs> uh, Jerome, is it a super quick question? Well, uh, maybe uh, one minute and then we have to close down to make sure we wrap up in time. No, it's not a question. It was uh, actually a, a response to the, the last comment, uh, which I suppose uh, was in part directed to my comment in the chat uh, about unions uh, disappearing over time. Um, so, I mean, someone like Karl Polanyi talks in The Great Transformation about the disappearance and appearance of social classes over time and economic classes over time. So we should not assume that a working class is something that will always exist. It is a, a product of the, you know, social industrial relations we have today. And if we have different ones, then uh, it's possible that we will have different social and economic classes. And those will require perhaps <clears throat> different institutions, different technologies, and methods of organizing, communicating, and interacting. So I guess that's, in a nutshell, what I would respond with. Awesome. Well, um, thank really you, an everyone, observation. for... Really an observation. Um, thank, thank you, everyone, for just a fantastic session, a great exchange, uh, insights about this process, but more importantly, insights about how tools like this could be improved and used in different ways. So one last plug, um, we did actually get funding to make this a Canada-wide initiative in the coming years, so stay tuned for information on that. Um, and um, yeah, reach out if you have any questions about any of this. And um, we also just wanted to make sure we can promote the next session taking place, uh, which will be on May 24th, Assessing Progress of Zero Long-Term Employment uh, Territory in France and Belgium. So Isabel, I don't know if you want to share that information in the chat, but another great session as part of this network coming up. With that, I think we are we're able to close down the session again with appreciating the opportunity to present our work, share our perspectives, and, and help. Hopefully that was of some value to the network as well. I know we've come away very energized about our, our national project that will take the Ontario pilot, broaden it out to all of Canada. I, I Simon just in the private chat told me how excited he feels after this, because you, you do get a little bit worried that no, this will fall on deaf ears and it might not, not have an impact, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really great. Keep up with the great work. See you soon, everyone. Take care. Thank bye you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.